So welcome to the early morning session on security and privacy uh, for democracy. Um, we have a, an eclectic and I think exciting panel this morning. Um, we're going, we have uh, speakers from all sorts of interesting um, walks of life and sectors from academia to government uh, to nonprofits. And we're going to do some deep dives on different kinds of uh, technology that uh, is enabling security and privacy for democracy. Um, and we'll also talk about some of the risks. Um, so the format for this morning is uh, each of the panelists is going to give uh, some brief about 10 minutes of uh, remarks on their domain area. And then we're going to engage uh, in a half hour of panel discussion. Um, for those of you who are uh, watching at home, uh, if, if you do have a question, I suppose you could tweet and, and uh, perhaps one of us will, will catch it. Um, but otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll have the questions uh, after the, the panelists' presentations. Um, so our panelists this morning, first we have uh, Roger Dingledine. Uh, he is the president and co-founder of the Tor Project. Um, you're probably familiar with that from uh, anonymous web browsing. Um, then we'll have Simpson Garfinkel. Uh, he is the chief of the Center for Disclosure Avoidance Research at the US Census Bureau. Um, so some exciting things going on at the census for the next census. Um, Philippa Gill, she is an assistant professor in the computer science department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, then Daniela uh, Oliveira, she's an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, at the University of Florida. Uh, Dan Wallach is going to close. Uh, he's a professor in both the Departments of Computer Science and Electrical Computer Engineering and a Rice Scholar at the <laughs> Baker Institute for Public Policy uh, at Rice University. Um, but what I'd like to do uh, is begin with Roger. Um, so let me just, uh, as Roger's uh, uh, warming up here. Let me just briefly tell you a little bit about uh, his background. Um, so how many of you have heard of Tor? Okay. Um, how many, oh, everybody knows Tor. Okay. And how many people, okay, I won't ask the next question. Um, so Tor is a very interesting tool and has a long history, very related to anonymity, uh, anti-censorship, and anti-surveillance. But let me tell you some things that you might not be able to read about uh, Roger. Uh, don't worry, I won't say anything too bad. So um, a couple years ago, I had the honor of, of uh, chairing the Usenix Security Symposium, uh, where Roger and his team received the Test of Time Award. Uh, the Test of Time Award in this particular uh, security conference recognizes long-standing, long-term research, sort of big risk things that really were successful over, over a period of, uh, on the order of 10 years or more. Um, and I asked Roger, uh, about his research paper uh, that the Tor team had co-authored describing the basic architecture of Tor. Um, and I asked, well, you know, how, you know, there were students in the audience and I said, uh, you know, was this your first submission of the paper? And he said, no, it was actually rejected by uh, a different conference the, the year before. Um, and then I looked back in the program and I noticed that there were three papers in the, the session uh, Tor was the middle paper sandwiched by the best student paper award and the best conference paper award, and then Tor got no award. Um, but then 10 years later, uh, nobody was familiar with any of the other papers except Tor. So sometimes uh, when you're looking for long-term research, you won't notice it until 10 years later. Um, but with that, I would just like to introduce uh, Roger, and he's going to tell us about the Tor project. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Dingledine, and I'm going to tell you... Uh, little pieces about Tor and I'm going to talk, I'm basically having a bunch of different topics for my 10 minute slot and I'm going to, uh, happy to answer questions afterwards and uh, hopefully this will give you some things to think about uh, that are the various pieces of what Tor works on and the research that Tor uh, creates. So Tor is an online community of people around the world working towards making more privacy tools, helping people be safer on the internet. The main piece of it is what's called Tor Browser, and the idea is that you can browse the web more safely without being tracked and traced. And there are a bunch of pieces to that. I'll get to them soon. There are some number of users. It's an anonymity or privacy tool, so it's hard to count the number of users we have. But we have something like 2 million people using Tor every day. So what are we talking about here? What's the, the big picture? We've got Alice over here. She wants to browse the web or connect to some service called Bob, and she wants to do this in a way that, that's safe. What do we mean by safe? Maybe there's somebody watching Alice's local network, and they want to know like the 
monopoly Tunisian telecom or something, they want to know where she's connecting to, or maybe somebody is watching CNN or watching WikiLeaks and they want to know who is connecting to that service. Or maybe there's somebody in the middle of the network that's trying to surveil everything like AT&T or GCHQ. Uh, so there are a bunch of different places where adversaries might be in this scenario. One important thing to realize, anonymity or privacy is not the same as encryption. Encryption is good, you should use encryption, but even when you're using encryption, people still get to see who you're talking to, when you're talking to them, how much you're talking. And this metadata is what a lot of different groups in the world uh, use to attack things. So you could imagine that people try to break the encryption and, and that's what they focus on, but really the intelligence agencies and the corporate equivalents uh, try to build the social network of who's talking to who, and then they have a graph of who's interesting, and then they go to the person in the middle who's extra interesting and break into their house or, or uh, break into their laptop or something like that. So encryption is worthwhile, but it's not the whole story. Uh, hopefully you know the phrase, uh, we kill people with metadata, that uh, an NSA person said a couple of years ago. Okay, so I actually only use the word anonymity when I'm talking to other researchers uh, like the panel. When I'm talking to my parents and grandparents, I tell them I'm working on a privacy system because anonymity is a little bit scary, but privacy is a good American value. And then uh, when I'm talking to other companies, uh, Google and Walmart and so on, I work on communication security because anonymity, I don't know why a company would want that, and privacy is dead, some, some big corporate big shot said that, uh, but network security or communication security, of course I need that. And then when I'm talking to uh, governments and military, I work on traffic analysis resistant communication networks. <laughs> and again, it's the same system, it's the same security properties. The goal is to get all these different groups and blend them into the same network so that they can blend together. You can't have a, a privacy system for cancer survivors because then everybody would know the fact that you downloaded it and that you're using it. They would know why you're using it. And then the fourth category we've been working on in recent years is the human rights or reachability side. People around the world who can't get to BBC or other websites like that uh, and they want to get around censorship and surveillance. So part of the goal of Tor is to gather all these people into the same system so that they can blend together. So how do you build one of these? The easy answer is you put one big computer somewhere and it's a central proxy and everybody asks for a web page and it fetches the web page and it promises not to, not to reveal who wants to fetch what. So there are a couple of problems. The, the main problem is what if that big central point uh, decides to fail? So basically the architecture here is privacy by promise where I, I can see everything, but I promise I won't write it down. Okay, actually I do log everything, but I promise I won't tell anybody else. And that, that can get uh, into a pretty scary situation. Long ago I was talking to the CTO of one of these anonymizer companies and he was saying, we never answer subpoenas. If we ever answered a subpoena, nobody would trust us again. So of course we never answer subpoenas. And then like six months later, I was doing a talk for the US Department of Justice and one of them interrupted me and said, why can't you be like anonymizer? It's easy, we send them a subpoena, they send us an answer, it's easy, why can't you be like that? And I say that not to pick on any particular company, the problem is the architecture, the problem is there's a centralized point where they have all the data, they know everything that's happening and they promise they won't sell it or misuse it or lose it or something like that. So the goal of Tor is to have uh, distributed trust so that you're routing over multiple relays around the world, around the internet, and the goal of this is that no single relay gets to learn that it's Alice talking to Bob. So that means it doesn't come down to uh, privacy by promise, it comes down to privacy by design or privacy by architecture. Okay, and there's encryption that makes everything safer. Happy to, happy to talk about that one later. So I talked before about the IP layer, IP address layer anonymity or privacy where we're trying to hide uh, what address you're going to or what address you're coming from. On top of that is the browser level privacy issue where if you take an ordinary Firefox or Internet Explorer or something like that and you try to uh, safely browse the web, there are all these cookies and flash and fonts and 
uh, and the list goes on and on. There are hundreds of different tracking mechanisms inside browsers. So in addition to the program called Tor, we also have a program called Tor Browser that tries to fix all of those. And we have a growing set of uh, basically patches on Firefox to, uh, to fix a bunch of privacy issues that could be used to track or trace or, or remember and so on about you. So another interesting piece is the, uh, the performance side of the network. Here's a graph. The green line is the capacity of the thousands of relays around the world who are running the volunteer Tor network. And the purple line is the load on it. So it's up to 100 gigabits per second. I was talking to the fellow running the Princeton uh, internet connection, and he was saying that Princeton does about one gigabits per second. Uh, so you can think of the Tor network as 100 Princetons if you want uh, some sort of scale uh, to go with it. So we're, we're comparable to what Wikipedia pushes these days in terms of, of internet traffic also. So there are some really interesting performance research questions about as these two lines separate, Tor gets faster and faster because we've got enough capacity to handle that. Okay, so some other exciting things to think about. Uh, how do you actually measure safety or privacy in these things? So one answer for measuring uh, the, the amount of safety that Tor provides is looking at the diversity of where the relays are located. As we get more and more relays, and as they end up in more and more different places around the world, an attacker who can look at a given fraction of the internet becomes less and less capable of seeing enough of the Tor network to match up this incoming flow, matches up with that, that outgoing flow. So that diversity of relays is, is one piece. Another piece is diversity of use cases. So for example, imagine you've got a lot of people in Iran using Tor, and they're using it to get around the censorship and surveillance. You might think, Every single person in Iran using Tor is a political dissident, and we need to you know, go round them all up. But actually, as Iran filters Facebook, and filters your web comics, and filters the cute cats, and so on, the more ordinary people there are who used to go to blogs, and used to go to Facebook, and they want to get some tool to get around it. So once you've got 50,000 people in Iran using Tor, the average Tor user is the average internet user. It's just somebody who wants to go get to the cute cat pictures and they've been censored, so they need some way to get around it. And that, that ordinariness is key to being safe. So something else to keep in mind, uh, the transparency from Tor's perspective is, is the key way to achieve this. So first of all, that's uh, free software, open source software, and we tell you all about the design and we have the research paper that Kevin was talking about uh, to basically show everybody how it works and how we think it works and help and get other people thinking about it. Uh, you might think of this as, uh, hey, those privacy people are talking about transparency, ha, 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 what a, what a contradiction. The key is privacy is about choice, and we choose to be transparent in order to accomplish our goals as best we can, even though we are building tools to let other people also choose about whether they're going to publish things. So something else uh, that's exciting, the Tor Metrics Project is an NSF-funded uh, data set of uh, looking at where the relays have been over time and what countries are using Tor over time. And we publish all of this data in a privacy-preserving way. So here's a fun graph of Tor use in Russia a year and a bit ago. And I was talking to somebody at Facebook, and they have exactly the inverse of this graph in their secret Facebook data set. So every time Facebook gets blocked in Russia, there's a spike of Tor usage and a drop of Facebook usage on their secret data set. So here's a, a fun example where you can see censorship in action. Uh, and then we have some other interesting graphs. That, so the, the Tor metrics uh, site is full of interesting graphs like this. Some of them are not well explained. What happened in UAE earlier this year? Uh, that caused this huge spike in, in use, and then they didn't need it anymore, and then they did, and then they didn't, and now they do again. Uh, I don't know what's happening in that country, and it'd be really interesting to track down. Okay, so yet another thing to, to ponder is the, uh, the censorship side of Tor. So originally Tor was a privacy tool, and the goal is uh, you can visit websites safely. Then we realized, hey, wait a minute, Countries like China are gonna start blocking connections into the Tor network, and they're gonna start making it hard for people to, to reach Tor, and that means maybe Tor is good at security, but if you can't get to the Tor network, then who cares how good it is at security? So uh, China actually started doing that, Iran started doing that, Kazakhstan started doing that, and the, the fix is 
adding another set of transports at the beginning of Torah that basically transform the traffic so that it looks like something else. So that, and there are a bunch of research projects that people are working on at various universities to transform the Torah traffic into something that's harder to block. And so one example is you turn it into something that look, looks like Skype video, and if they're willing to let Skype video through the firewall, then Tor gets to go through the firewall also. Uh, yet another piece of Tor that's interesting to think about is the onion service or hidden service design. So what I talked about so far is you get to go to a website in a way that the website can't figure out where you're coming from. Let's use that building block and turn it around so that you can run a website or a service in a way that people can reach your service, but nobody needs to be able to learn where the service is that they're going to. And so one fun example of that is Facebook set up an Onion service to let people get to its website more safely from around the world. So for example, in Turkey, they have a lot of users and the Turkish government is known for trying to attack the users and man in the middle of the connections to Facebook. So using Tor Onion services lets Facebook provide stronger security uh, for its users. And then a last thing to think about, and this is gonna transition more into what Philippa will talk about, is the censorship measurement or interference measurement side. So there's a project called UNI, the Open Observatory of Network Interference, and the goal of that is you make a connection from wherever you are in Singapore or something uh, to a potentially censored web page, and then you connect to the same page over Tor and you compare the responses. And the goal of that is to build a growing data set of what the internet looks like around the world. And we publish all of that data and there are a bunch of journalists all around the world who are looking at that public data set and trying to draw conclusions about how the internet looks from different places. Thank you. All right, thank you, Roger. So uh, we'll be switching to Simpson now. Um, let me uh, briefly introduce Simpson as he's getting uh, queued up on the computer. Um, so I've known Simpson for, uh, gosh, I think about 20, 20 plus years now. Uh, first ran into him in um, an MIT freshman class on uh, 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 the uh, electronic frontier, and he was not a freshman, I'll just say. Um, but he is now at the U.S. Census Bureau, uh, where he is the chief of the Center for Disclosure Avoidance Research. Uh, we are now avoiding his slides. Um, but let me tell you just a little bit, as we move from counter-surveillance to counting and surveillance, um, the U.S. Census is uh, about to begin some very interesting uh, projects uh, involving differential privacy, and Simpson's going to tell us about that. Um, Simpson is a prolific writer. Um, apparently, last night he was writing articles uh, still, um, what he tells me, but he's written all sorts of interesting things. He, he's the author of 14 different books. All of the books are fairly well known. Um, so some of the more well-known books include things like uh, Database Nation. If you haven't read this book, um, go out and get it before the next edition comes out. Um, but um, I, I think it's what, about, is it 10 years old now? Came out, oh, okay, I'm a little bit, I, I, my, my clock is off, uh, about 17 years ago. And if you read the book, unfortunately, pretty much all the predictions came true. Um, and so you can learn a lot about what happens when you gather large amounts of data, you know, who could have ever predicted something like an Equifax? I mean, it's just impossible. Um, so go read that book and you can get a different perspective. Um, he's also written some other books like, um, for instance, he uh, wrote about the history of the lab for computer science. It's a very fascinating book about the history of computing uh, at, at MIT. Um, many of us up here uh, are recipients of uh, the MIT TR35 award. Simpson writes for the MIT Technology Review. Um, so all, all very connected. Um, but without any further ado, uh, Simpson is going to tell us about some interesting things going on at the US Census Bureau. So thank you very much. Um, this is a, a much longer presentation, and I'm just going to be doing selected parts of it here and there. <clears throat> this work is uh, not my work. It's based on work of a large scientific team at the Census Bureau, headed by uh, Dan Kiefer and John Avowed, the chief scientist of the Bureau, but there are many other participants. Um, and basically, I'm going to describe our plans for the 2020 Census and why we're using a technique called differential privacy to make it more private than previous census. So to understand why we want to do this, you need to understand 
what is done with the census data. In 2010, um, we surveyed uh, 308 million people, and we basically published, uh, we collected, after editing, five data elements for each person. Their age, their race, their sex, their uh, the house that they live in, and their relationship to the householder, person number one, whether they were the spouse, or whether they were the child, or the, the, the adult parent. <coughs> and based on that, we published 5.6 billion independent tabular summaries. So basically 5.6 billion queries on a data set of 308 million times five, or about 1.5 billion numbers. So you can build a set of simultaneous equations and solve for the confidential data. And that's called database reconstruction. It was discovered in 2013, uh, 2003. <coughs> and differential privacy was created to figure out how much noise needed to be added to a data set so that you couldn't reliably do the database reconstruction. Uh, 2010 was too soon. We were already in route for the 2010 census. So this is the first census that we've been able to make use of that, uh, that mathematical breakthrough. Now, I'm at the Center for Disclosure Avoidance and we are building a disclosure avoidance system for the census. And we basically take all the survey responses and we edit them to make them correct. People make mistakes and we fix them. Uh, and, and then it runs through a disclosure avoidance system and the output is then sent to a tabulation system. And in, 20, in 2000 and 2010, we called that the 100% detail file and that's sensitive data, that's restricted data. In 2020, we're calling it the microdata detail file and it won't be restricted data. So in 2000 and 2010, the protection system to protect identifiable families, so like we're going to publish a tabulation of how many people of each race live on each block of the United States. We have to do that to help the Department of Justice uh, enforce the Voting Rights Act. And, and sometimes these families are identifiable, like they might have a lot of uh, you know, people of one age or people of one race. And so what we did in 2000 and 2010 was we found identifiable families and we swapped them with families that were not identifiable in another uh, area. And, and the nice thing about swapping is that if you summarize at a larger geography level, the tabulations are all still correct. But, and so it's easy to understand, it doesn't affect your state totals, but the problem is there's actually no privacy guarantee with swapping. And um, we actually can't tell you the details of how the swapping works, because if we do, you can undo it. And um, it also doesn't protect you if there's external data sets that can be correlated against. So I'm going to uh, go past this, these slides. For 2020, we're building a system based on formal privacy techniques Formal privacy means that there's a mathematical definition for privacy, and then there are algorithms that accomplish, that achieve that mathematical definition, and that also then do some sort of data manipulation. And the goal with formal privacy techniques is to make those data manipulations as privacy protecting as possible, and yet still come up with useful data. Uh, unlike 2000 and 2010, our 2020 system is a public system. We're going to be publishing the source code for it. We're going to be describing all of the privacy decisions. The only thing that we're not going to be publishing is the initial settings of the random number generators used to create the noise that is used to create the formal privacy. So the way this system works is uh, we take the, the data and we, we infuse noise in it, but we do it in a way that controls uh, the things that are important for the tabulation so that they're still all correct. And, and the advantage here is that it's still easy to understand. It provides a tunable privacy guarantee. So we can actually control the tr privacy accuracy trade-off. Uh, it doesn't depend upon external data, these privacy guarantees. And, and the privacy operations are composable, which means we can build a complicated system and, and analyze it and implement it piece by piece. Uh, but the disadvantage is we have to process the entire country at once. And we also, um, every use of the private data has to be accounted for within the Census Bureau, and, and that has been a, a challenge. So, <clears throat> so 
I said we're, we're producing a, a data set which we call the microdata detail file and then we're going to put that into the tabulation system. And the advantage of this is that it's still familiar to internal and external stakeholders. We can still produce the same data products that we need to. Uh, but most importantly, unlike other differential privacy systems, this approach will give us consistent answers. And that's, that's very important for our stakeholders. So there are two sets of queries that we have to do on this confidential data set. Um, there are the, some of the queries have to be exact under law and our agreements with the Department of Justice. Um, the total number of people on every block, we can't change that. The total number of people who are voting age on every block, we can't change that. And the total number of householders and vacancies on every block, we can't change that. But other, other parameters are actually changed, and this is a, a practice that goes back decades. It's called disclosure avoidance. And the idea is you make systematic changes in the data set to protect people's privacy, but those changes have to be small enough that the statistical conclusions you base on that data are still correct. And the problem with every disclosure avoidance technique in the past is that because people didn't talk about them, we actually couldn't say what the accuracy privacy trade-off was. But, but now we can. So the precise distribution of ages on, of people over 18 and under 18, that's going to be different on every block than it is in reality. And how different that is, is going to depend on that privacy accuracy trade-off. Likewise, there'll be changes made to, to the races that are reported on a block-by-block -block basis. Now, this is done with a noise infusion technique, such that if there are be 100 or 1,000 people living on the block, the the overall percentages would be very close to being correct. But if there's just one or two people living on the block, the percentages might be quite different. And the guarantee with formal privacy, with differential privacy, is that if any one person is taken in or take it, put in or taken out of the data set or their attributes are changed, the, the results are roughly the same if they were there or if they weren't there. And the way the results are roughly the same is that there's noise added, but that noise doesn't depend upon the underlying data that noise depends upon the possible tabulations from that underlying data. <coughs> so the way this system will work, and, and I only have two minutes, is that we take the data for everybody in the United States and we create a synthetic population which has similar statistics for the things that we can change but exact statistics for the things that we can't change. And then those records are put into a single national table, and that table is then divided up. It's divided up to every state, and then within the states, um, uh, it's divided up into every county, and within the counties, it's divided up into every census tract, and then to every block group, and then finally to, to every block. And what this process does, and is that it assures that the counts that have to be perfect will be perfect. So every state is going to have the correct number of people in it. Every block will have the correct number of people on it. But the result of this, of this process is that the distributions are going to be very similar for large populations, if you have 1,000 people on that block. And they'll be off uh, if you have one or two people on that block. And the amount that they're off depends upon this relationship between privacy and accuracy. <clears throat> One of the things that, that we're going to then be able to do, which has never been done before, is that we're going to be able to produce a certificate that says the accuracy uh, of the census tabulation. So the tabulations were not correct in 2010 and 2020. The, the, in 20, 2000, the, the number on every block was correct, but the race distributions, the age distributions, they were not correct because of the amount of swapping. They were close, but we never said how far off they were. For, for 2020, we'll be able to say how, how far off they are. So this is the graph of pretty much accuracy by privacy loss. And you could imagine a system where there's uh, no privacy, um, total privacy loss, but total accuracy. And you could imagine a system where there's no privacy loss, so everybody has privacy, but there's no accuracy. So we know how to build those two systems. And, and we actually know how to build this system, the DAS2 system, where we can tune the amount of privacy versus the amount of accuracy. And we're working on this DAS3 system, which for any given privacy point gives more accuracy. 
But where to set this value, this is the epsilon value, that is a policy decision. And in 2020, the policymakers at the Census Bureau, the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, they're going to be making that decision, and they're going to be making that decision uh, in with a, a variety of open and transparent methods. So I've, I've hit my, my time limit. Um, and uh, there's a 2018 end-to-end -end test where we're going to be producing a, a subset of these tables, but the whole thing will be live for 2020. So thank you very much. Thank you, Simpson. So exciting things at the census. Okay, so we, we've covered anonymity, we've covered counting, and now we're going to get to a different kind of counting and understanding internet measurement um, from a democracy point of view. Um, so as uh, Philippa's getting uh, queued up here on her slides, let me tell you a little bit about her background uh, before she gets in uh, to her slides. Um, so she's an assistant professor uh, at the University of Massachusetts, or UMass Amherst. Uh, where her research focuses on novel network measurement techniques to understand online information controls, network interference, and interdomain routing. Um, from a democracy point of view, she can measure things. She can measure very interesting things on the internet and learn about what's actually going on. Um, she's recently been recognized as, as an MIT uh, TR35 uh, Technology Review 35. Uh, she's received the uh, NSF Career Award from the National Science Foundation and Best Paper Awards from conferences like the ACM Internet Measurement Conference. Um, one anecdote I'd just like to share. Um, we met recently at a National Academy event uh, where the National Academy was trying to do cross-pollination between U.S. researchers and German researchers uh, at the Frontiers uh, of Engineering uh, German-American event. Um, and uh, let's just say these are really big problems uh, that go beyond any one border, um, internet measurement is something that is going to be global, probably interplanetary in the future. But uh, Philippa, your remarks, please. Hi. Thanks, everyone, for coming out so early in the morning. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about my work on developing a science of censorship resistance. So understanding you know, how can we be rigorous about measuring censorship, and how can we design and evaluate uh, circumvention schemes. As Kevin mentioned, the core of my research is really uh, network measurement. And the challenge we face here is that, you know, what we want to measure and what we can measure generally are two different things. And part of the reason for this is a lot of the features that make the internet successful and popular also make it hard to measure. So the internet is decentralized. We've got ISPs um, basically routing traffic between each other. There's no global measurement primitive that says, give me the topology of the internet. And there's actually strong incentives to hide information. So here, you know, ISP C might not want ISP A to learn that he's a customer of ISP B. And so one of the challenges we face here is how can we actually learn paths on the network? Also, there's a variety of edge networks. So, you know, you're home watching Netflix on your smart TV. You're probably checking email on your phone. Um, you know, we've also got data centers in companies like Google and Microsoft. And one of the big challenges we face here is how do we get vantage points? How do we know what the internet looks like from all of these different places? And for censorship research, you can think of this as, you know, trying to get vantage points in countries all over the world, in different ISPs. Um, further, we've, got, we've also got a variety of content. So, you know, playing Candy Crush on your phone or watching Netflix, um, social networks. And one of the challenges we face here is how are we actually going to measure all of these different applications? It's not really a one-size-fits-all problem. And when we talk about measuring network interference, <laughs> things get even harder. Um, now we're measuring a network where the network might try to actively conceal what it's doing. So governments might not want you to know that they're filtering specific types of content. Um, you know, they might not uh, filter consistently. They might change what they do based on content. And the measurements might actually pose a risk to users in some countries. So the challenge we're facing here is really how are we going to measure uh, when what we want to measure is trying to hide from us. So what my group is doing in terms of trying to solve these problems is taking a collaborative approach. I work a lot with political scientists and they usually have a question they want to answer with some data 
and we design new measurement techniques and tools that allow them to really understand what's going on and have solid data when they go out and write reports. Um, in terms of circumvention, we've done some work incorporating empirical data. So we looked at making an AS-aware version of the Tor client, uh, which Roger talked about. Um, we also look at uh, designing covert channels, so those pluggable transports. And uh, today I'm going to be talking mostly about my work measuring politically motivated actors. Uh, so here we looked at you know, targeted attacks against NGOs, so what sort of social engineering is happening. And we've also looked at trying to pinpoint exactly which filtering product is being used. Okay, so just to give you guys a high level view of what we're doing here, uh, you can think of measuring internet censorship as basically you fetch your web page in your lab setting and you measure, you fetch it in the field, so Yemen, Burma, wherever you're interested in, and you might get a result like this. So you can see in the lab, we see CNN, everything's good, and in the field we see a block page. So it says, you know, access denied, uh, the URL has been blocked. So the standard question that people have generally asked is, is this website blocked? Um, and I think in this case we can all agree, yes, it looks like it's being blocked. But what happens if we have a result like this? So we've gotten CNN in the lab, and in the field we have nothing. So the person tries to load the web page, and there's no web page loaded. Now, how do we know if the website is blocked? Is it blocked? Is the network down? Is there some misconfiguration somewhere? And what we really need to understand these situations is more fine-grained measurements. Um, so my student jokingly, I think he actually put, a, put this on a t-shirt, he says packet captures or it didn't happen. Um, so, you know, actually having detailed network, uh, you know, basically traces of what happened on the network, and we can look at these and actually pinpoint, you know, this looks like an injected packet, this was a reset packet, um, you know, and really try to dig down and figure out what's happening. Um, and we also want to answer more questions than just is content blocked or not. We want to know how was the site blocked? Was it blocked using a product that's under export controls? Uh, was it uh, blocked with a reset packet? And who's blocking it? So you might have heard some cases where users around the world were accidentally filtered by China, for example, if their DNS traffic happened to go through China. Um, you know, and we want to know, are people being filtered by their ISP? Are they being filtered by something in the middle of their network path? Are they being filtered by the content providers? So this is something uh, Tor, I believe, is interested in, understanding how, you know, Wikipedia is going to treat a Tor user versus a regular user. So these are the sorts of questions that we want to answer. And what this means for measurement, uh, broken animation, um, is that we don't actually know the set of measurements we want to support ahead of time. So if a new filtering product comes out or they have a new technique for censoring traffic, we need to be able to adapt and design new tests and measurements. Uh, we also want to be able to uh, be flexible. So if a new situation arises, there's an election going on, we want to be able to get in there and measure as fast as possible. Um, so this is one of the big things that uh, our IC Lab platform does um, that existing measurement systems really struggled with is you know, basically being able to programmatically send out uh, experiments and you basically just run them on demand versus um, when I was working with the Citizen Lab, the workflow was sort of, you call your friend in Saudi Arabia who calls his friend in Qatar, who hits enter, and you just really hope the data comes back. Um, we had an incident before a deadline where it didn't. Um, so we're really trying to, um, you know, have a bit more power and control of how we're doing these measurements. And Obviously, there's a bit of a trade-off here. It actually took us a couple of years to figure out how to do this well. And, you know, as a computer scientist, I would love to have root on a device in a network and just be able to send whatever I want. But maybe people don't want uh, a device in their network that's under the control of someone else making arbitrary requests on the network. And then on the other end, you know, we want to think about security for the client. So we're really trying to balance the power of the measurements we can run with you know, not having a device on the person's network that can do all sorts of uh, strange things. Okay, so just to give you an overview of the system that we've built, uh, our system is called IC Lab, or Information Controls Lab, and basically we've got a control server that sits at uh, UMass, and it sends experiments and relevant data to clients all around the world, and these clients run the measurements, send the results back, 
Um, one of the key decisions we made here was to actually keep the clients as simple as possible. So we want to get as much data as we can and do the bulk of the analysis back in the lab. So if, if we figure out that you know, maybe this analysis we're doing could be improved, we still have all the data and can rerun it. Um, and so you know, basically data goes into database, we analyze it, uh, we've done work on detecting block pages. Uh, this is surprisingly challenging. Uh, so you can't just say, are the pages different because of regionalization and different factors like that. Uh, we've also looked at fingerprinting to figure out if the product is NetSweeper, Bluecoat, to understand which products are being used. And then finally, the output of this, you know, web pages, reports, junior faculty, so hopefully published papers. Um, and we've been working with the Berkman Center on sort of making this data more accessible and available to people. Uh, so to finish up, I'm just going to go through a couple of case studies where IC Lab has actually been useful. So in the first case, uh, I believe it was a couple years ago now, uh, there was a conflict in Yemen where this rebel group was implementing censorship. And what happened was the Citizen Lab came to me and they said, hey, we're testing in Yemen, we're seeing this block page for some content, and then we're seeing an HTTP 404 page for other content. And we were like, and they were like, okay, is this actually a 404 page? Is the server giving us this error or is this some form of censorship? And uh, I'm not gonna go into details because of time, but we were actually able to get packet captures and see that this 404 page had very similar headers to that block page. So it basically, we could say that this 404 page is coming from the NetSweeper device as well. Uh, in the second case, all right <laughs> anyway, so we did some work with um, small media in the UK and they were interested in understanding filtering in Iran from a lot of different perspectives one of the questions they had was how do sanctions impact censorship and this was interesting because they came to us and they said you know okay there's sanctions in place um, what is being blocked and I think they were expecting more blocking on the Iran side but what we found is sites like Google, in, sites that are located in the US and can't really serve these users, are giving these users error messages. So we saw you know, a 403 message from Google, which basically says Google is blocking this to enforce the sanctions. Uh, to wrap up, in terms of what we need, um, you know, there's still fundamental network measurement challenges. These are the same challenges we've had for 15 plus years. Um, so things like IP geolocation, if anyone out there has fiddled around with that, you understand how inaccurate it is. Also measuring and predicting network paths. We can't always get vantage points. Can we model or find ways of figuring out what these paths might look like? Um, and in this case, uh, the measurement is actually more important because this is a security sensitive case. If we're using this prediction of a path to inform the selection of your Tor relays, you really want it to be accurate because someone could be surveilled or you know, basically have unintended consequences. Also, we're pushing the boundaries of measurement. Um, so there's some great work at Berkeley, so this isn't my group, but looking at TCP side channels to detect censorship. Um, and also, there's a lot of thought in our research community right now in terms of trading off the scale of measurements with the um, basically how fine grained they are. So the TCP side channel and some other work uh, at Berkeley, they're able to get sort of a broad view of censorship, but it's not as fine-grained, whereas with IC Lab, we've got, you know, all the way to packet captures, but we aren't necessarily going to be able to do a global measurement. And finally, the goal here is to really understand how sensors behave. If you design a circumvention scheme tomorrow, you want to make sure that, you know, it's going to be resilient to what sensors will do, and we really don't have a good idea of what you know, what will they do? What do they care about? How much effort are they willing to put in to blocking different applications? Um, so with that, I'll wrap up. Uh, here's my website, and I'm also on Twitter. Thanks, Philippa. Okay, um, so our, our next speaker is Daniela uh, Oliveira. She is an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Florida. Um, she's worked on a number of different research projects having to do with security and privacy. Um, today, she's gonna talk primarily about social engineering 
uh, as it relates to uh, uh, security and privacy for democracy. But let me tell you a little bit about her background. Um, she got her BS and MS degrees in computer science uh, in Brazil um, and earned her PhD from the University of California, Davis, uh, UC Davis. Um, some other interesting accolades. Um, so she received the uh, NSF Career Award, but there's a sort of a special category of career awards um, for the, the more highly selective, and she received a, a P case, a Presidential Early Career Award um, for her early research as a junior faculty member. Um, also interesting is that she actually co-chaired the event uh, uh, on things related to uh, internet technologies and censorship uh, at this uh, event in Germany with the National Academy. Um, so she's uh, very well anointed um, with the, the landscape and is going to give us her thoughts today on uh, democracy and the implications of social engineering. Daniela, thank you. So good morning, everybody. Today I came to convince you to treat cyber social engineering as a first class threat to democracy. Social engineering is as old as time is the ability to influence someone into performing an action, good or bad. And it turns out that influence is a, a key factor in social engineering, and influencing people is a piece of cake. Let me explain this with a story about turkey mothers. Turkey mothers are very good mothers, but there is something odd about their mothering behavior. <coughs> It's triggered solely by the cheap, cheap sound that turkey chicks make. Everything else plays a very minor role. If the chick makes the cheap, cheap sound, the mother cares for it. If not, the mother ignores it or can even kill the chick. An experiment illustrates this very odd behavior to the extreme. So this is the polecat, the turkey natural predator. The researcher presented the turkey mother with a stuffed version of the polecat. And the turkey mother mounted a vicious attack on the polecat, as expected. Then the researcher presented the turkey mother with a stuffed version of the polecat that had the small tape uh, recorder inside playing the cheap, cheap sound. Guess what? The turkey mother cared for it. And you guys are thinking this is absurd. It's just like she's an automaton. She will care for a predator, but she can kill her own cheeks. So it turns out that these fixed pattern actions uh, or heuristics, they are very common in many species, including us, humans. Heuristics, they are very beneficial because they allow us to make good, quick decisions without consuming too much brain power. But the problem is when an adversary tries to use uh, our heuristics to harm us, in effect playing the cheap, cheap uh, sound on us. My research group was curious about how people are susceptible to certain heuristics or weapons of influence that we face in our everyday life. Authority. People tend to comply to requests made by figures of authority. Scarcity. Whenever uh, we perceive uh, an opportunity as a limit, as a av limit availability, we want it. Commitment and consistent. Once we take a stand, we feel very pressured to behave consistently according to, to our uh, opinion or what we stand for. The brain has difficulties dealing with inconsistency. Liking. We tend to comply to requests to people that we like or that we perceive as similar to us in any respect. Reciprocity. Whenever people give, uh, do us a favor, or give us a gift, we tend to reciprocate. We feel in doubt. Social proof, when in doubt, we tend to follow other people's footsteps. So let's see an influence scenario compromising democracy. Hypothetical. Uh, so this is Bob Harris. He's the chairman of 2020 Anna Smith uh, campaign. His hobby, stamp collection. Even though he's very private, his daughter, Alice, has a public Facebook profile where she disclosures certain aspects of family life and she mentions his hobby in a comment. One day, uh, Mr. Harris receives the following email in his personal account. Dear Mr. Harris, my name is Eve Johnson and I'm in your daughter's Alice yoga class. 
She told me about your interest in stamps. My grandfather passed away recently and left me with a stamp collection from the 50s that I'd like to sell. I have a website set up with pictures and prices, and if you'd like to see it, please visit www.stampcollection.com. Thank you, Eve. So this is a scarcity in action. How can Bob not pay attention to this offer? It's not every day that a stamp collection from the 50s become available. So he clicks to check it out, and he ends up installing malware in the headquarters computers and sensitive emails from Anna Smith and her staff leak to the public, uh, damaging her reputation. Far-fetched? Not really. So my group and I set out to understand people's susceptibility to these weapons of influence in the context of phishing, which is social engineering by email. And we use as a study case uh, older adults versus uh, young adults. Why are we interested in older adults' demographic? Well, uh, older adults are the fastest growing segment of the population in industrialized nations. As this animation shows, and as you can see, since the past and growing to the, to the present and future, the segment 65 and older growing. Uh, so here 2005, 2010, so now the present and getting growing and growing as projection for the future until 2030, when this group is gonna make 20% of the US population. They also control over half of the US financial wealth, and most importantly, uh, they occupy many positions of power in politics, finance, uh, business. So, but in terms of phishing and social engineering, why does demographics stand out? It turns out that as we age, our cognitive abilities change or decline. Uh, as we age, our crystallized intellig intelligence means experience increases, while our fluid intelligence, how fast we can process information, decreases. Also, as we age, our sensitivity to deception decreases. We become more, more trusting. And this is a very dangerous combination. So uh, my group uh, decided to uh, look at this, and this is very interesting because it's not every day that you see the program, NSF program manager that supports your research in the audience, right, Manzu, <laughs> when you're presenting your work. So we did this uh, study, this behavior-based study uh, with older and young adults. It was uh, at their home, and it was micro-longitudinal with less 21 days. They didn't know what was the purpose of the study, and they install only in their web brow in their uh, browser a plugin that logged all the URLs that they visit during the study period. It was IRB approved, uh, and every day they received, uh, unbeknownst to them, uh, a phishing email that was counterbalanced based on the gender of the sender, the weapon of influence. We also were interested in looking at uh, how different life domains where they may was placed to uh, contribute to susceptibility like health, uh, security, social, ideological. Uh, we recruited 158 participants from the North Central Florida region, roughly distributed between older and young, uh, female and male. This is an example of uh, an email that one participant uh, received. So here we say, dear John, our resources show that you have a parking violation at this address. Please go to the website to pay or refuse your ticket, link, and Susan Smith. So you see here that this email, it plays with the authority weapon of influence, the parking, uh, the traffic correspondence, and also the legal life domain, the possibility that you have perhaps broken the law. Every mail was personalized. Uh, we address the participant by their names, and every mail contained events that were related to the county that the participant lived. Uh, every email had a link that was our central uh, variable susceptibility to phishing that directed the participant to a harmless web page. What did you find? Uh, we find a very high overall susceptibility to phishing. Over 43% of our participants click at least one. Some clicked more than once. Uh, the fact that they click had no correlation to the day they were in the study. Uh, we found a statistical significance for older adult susceptibility, and we are very surprised to see a huge effect for older women, uh, the most susceptible group. In terms of weapons of influence, so these highlighted the results that we found the statistical significance. 
uh, older adults uh, were very susceptible to reciprocation, while young adults were very susceptible to scarcity, and both groups highly susceptible to authority, for authority, no age difference. For the life domains, again, in red, the results we found the statistical significance. We didn't find an age difference, but uh, legal was the most uh, 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 impactful life domain. People are concerned about the possibility of breaking the law. Uh, in terms of interventions, uh, our community, the usable security community, has been doing a great job in terms of usable solutions, anti phishing uh, uh, training, and also even warnings for like let's say SSL uh, uh, issues. But the problem or the, the, the limitation of the solution is that they are they come in a one size fits all, and our research shows that uh, uh, one size does not fit all. What my group is working right now is on target solutions based on the demographics, and we started with age difference. We believe that a target warnings, a target training will require less from people, will overwhelm people less, and will lead to more compliance uh, uh, from people and better results. But more research is needed. We just look at older versus young. More research is needed in terms of other age groups, gender, and also culture, how culture impacts susceptibility. So as to end as food for thought, I talked about cyber social engineering phishing, but I also see this new frontier here in terms of influencing opinion, especially in case of voters, right? This also is cyber social engineering, and this also is where uh, influence and principles of influence will come to place. And I believe that people will have different susceptibilities that need to be studied. So our community needs to start looking at this very, very serious, uh, because we are already seeing this, not only in the United States, but in other countries. Uh, and we need to investigate, how, how can you better warn people, or how can you better discover influence, or like bad influence, or influence related to fake news? Uh, that could impact voters' decision. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Daniela. And that's a great lead in to our next speaker, uh, Dan Wallach uh, from Rice University, who's going to be speaking about uh, electronic voting. Uh, let me tell you about Dan as he's getting queued up. Um, so, uh, Dan is a professor in uh, uh, multiple departments, uh, in computer science and electrical uh, computer engineering, uh, as well as the Institute, Baker Institute for Public Policy. Um, so his research is really interesting because it spans the technology all the way to the public policy. Um, he was a member of the NSF-funded uh, multi-institution research center called Accurate, uh, or a center for correct uh, usable, re reliable, auditable, and transparent elections. Um, this was a project that uh, had been going on for many years uh, at the National Science Foundation. Um, also, one of the interesting things I want to point out is um, uh, Dan served as a member of the Air Force uh, Science Advisory Board. And um, it's, it's really great to see faculty serving and doing this kind of federal engagement uh, because uh, I'm sure uh, Dan can tell you stories uh, about how uh, the, the give and take and learning uh, from working with the government and uh, how that influences some of the, the research choices you might make. Uh, but it's great to see uh, that kind of federal engagement. But today, Dan is going to be talking about uh, electronic voting um, uh, and his adventures over the last several years. All right, thank you very much, Kevin. Um, so my name is Dan Wallach, and I'm going to tell you about some excitement that I've had working in security for electronic voting. But first, let's start with a very recent story that you're all somewhat familiar with. Uh, back in August last year, we learned that Russian hackers were possibly targeting our election systems. We didn't have a lot of details. We didn't have a lot of confidence in what this meant. But clearly, it was a wake-up call of sorts. I was invited to testify in front of the House Space Science and uh, Technology Committee in September, and my message then was this could potentially have a big impact and there are certain mitigations that we should do in a hurry. Um, then shortly after that, we heard it straight from the top that you know there was no, the, the Obama himself said, this is a big deal. Um, 
we very quickly learned that 33 states and 11 counties had requested help from the Department of Homeland Security. More recently, that number seemed to have grown to 39. And we started learning things that, like, for example, the Obama people went straight to the Russians and said, stop that or else. We don't actually know what the or else was, and we don't know if they actually stopped it or not. But we do know that the Russians weren't just targeting us. This is a general purpose attack that they had done against a number of other countries, whether it was simply doing denial of service attacks on the internet, uh, something they did in Estonia during Estonian elections, um, or uh, like there was a Ukrainian and Bulgarian servers that they specifically that managed their elections that they tried to attack. A lot of details in this particular article. My concern back in September was that our voter registration systems were just databases connected to the internet. And that leads to a bunch of obvious concerns, that you could damage or delete these databases, perhaps as a denial of service attack, just nuke them all together, or perhaps with partisan intent to damage the databases for people you want to s slow down their voting to advantage the other side. Now, the thing that you should ask is, yeah, but the voting machines are safe, right? They're not connected to the internet. Well, neither were these uh, nuclear uranium refinement uh, centrifuges in Iran. This is uh, former President Ahmadinejad so shown walking through. Nonetheless, Stuxnet was somehow able to attack the, the computers that ran these nuclear centrifuges. And that leads to concerns about insider threats or that Maybe the air gap you thought you had didn't have as much air in it as maybe you'd hoped. So then the election happened. Turns out for all the people raising red flags, the election still happens at the same time it always does, whether we're ready for it or not. Of course, the winner is generally happy with the outcome, but it's the loser who requires evidence. So this is Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate. She requested recounts in three states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Wisconsin votes on paper largely, and in their recount process, which was reasonably transparent, there were very small changes. Michigan is a much more complicated state, and with legal challenges that we never really got a complete recount, Pennsylvania largely votes electronically, and the recount never even began due to legal challenges. So, the recount process, such as it was, didn't really tell us very much, except that we need better recount processes. So the thing I want to talk about is how would you build a better voting machine? How would you build a better voting system writ large, registration voting, tabulation, publication? How could you do this to improve transparency, increase resistance to attack? Well, we had a very rare opportunity in 2011 when Dana de Beauvoir, the county clerk in Travis County, that's Austin, Texas, uh, spoke in front of a workshop of voting election technology people and said, we're gonna design a new system and you in the audience, we want your help. That's rare, that doesn't happen normally. So I'm gonna tell you about something that I and a number of other people we brought together helped design. This is just a quick schematic of our voting system. On the left of your screen is the internet and there's your voter registration terminal. Voter walks up and says, hi, my name is Dan Wallach. I'd like to vote, please. We're gonna give them a little barcode that encodes just their precinct. And then they're gonna walk over to the voting system. This is completely offline. It's not connected to the internet, but we, because we wanna have voters be able to vote in vote centers or early voting, we need to have this electronic, rep this, this barcode representation of your precinct number, otherwise we could have data entry error. Turns out human beings make mistakes, so we have to engineer around that. Anyway, you walk over, they scan it, and they hand you another piece of paper with a random five-digit number. At that point, you can walk over to any voting machine, type in the five-digit number, and say, I'm voting Alice for president, Bob for Senate, etc. When you're done, we're gonna do several interesting things. First, we're gonna create an encrypted representation of your vote and make copies of it on all the machines. In fact, we are even using a, a, a blockchain-like technology. Don't think Bitcoin, but think hash chains to protect integrity of vote storage. 
And we're also going to give you a pa printed paper ballot, which means no matter what goes wrong with all the electronics, you've got this wonderful piece of paper which you will deposit in a ballot box, physically. And it turns out that the motion of the paper ballot also has some interesting cryptographic significance that lets you catch the machine if it were cheating. I don't really have time today to talk about it, but it's super awesome and cool and avoids, but most users don't have to know that there's any crypto going on at all. Yet we can still catch the machine if it's cheating. And because of the crypto, we even give you a receipt that you can take home that allows you to prove that your vote was part of the total without being able to prove to a third party how you voted. So there's some very sophisticated cryptography under the hood, yet on the surface we're moving printed paper ballots and putting them in boxes. So this is what happens when usability people and security people get in a room and argue for a couple days. You get a system that has good properties on both sides. We've even built some prototypes. This is our version 2 prototype at Rice. You can see the guts here were a $30 Hewlett Packard inkjet printer where we removed the printer part and just used the paper path. And it's a Raspberry Pi is controlling it. Uh, we have a little USB speaker that will chit chat and a little HDMI screen to tell you, hey, please insert your ballot, etc. So that's maybe $100 worth of electronics and a $300 piece of bent metal. So the only piece of custom hardware we need is this. Everything else is off-the-shelf computers. It doesn't have to be expensive. So the, in my remaining time, I want to talk about some open research challenges given the adversary we seem to face. Um, first off, uh, online voter registration databases are a vulnerability. When we have adversaries who are apparently trying to tamper with our voter registration systems, that means we need to up our game. And I'm a big fan of making copies. I love copies. We can have a copy in every single precinct. We can have copies backed up offline. We can have lots and lots of copies. Because a database with, I don't know, a couple million voters fits in the palm of your hand these days. So why not make copies? And that means we have an interesting research challenge of replicating and reconciling these databases and allowing them to operate offline if necessary as a fallback. Right now, there's an interesting side effect of the Help America Vote Act in 2002, which is that all states now have a standard process called provisional voting. The idea is you show up at your polling place and I say, hi, I'm Dan Wallach, I'm here to vote. And they say, uh, we don't have a Dan Wallach, sorry. Well, uh, now you can say, you're wrong, I'm right, I demand the right to vote. And they say, no problem, sir and your ballot is now provisional. And in the case of paper balloting, that would mean you would go in an envelope that had your name and story on the outside of the envelope, and a panel of judges or jurors or whatever would make sure that, that okay, Dan Wallach really should have voted here. Then they take it out of the envelope and it gets tabulated with the rest of the votes. Some electronic systems have an electronic analog of that. Doing this for a small number of voters works fine. What would happen if we had a million people who wanted to exercise this because of damage to the voter registration database? So doing provisional voting in a usable, scalable way is a very interesting, even though it's kind of in the weeds challenge. And the last challenge I want to talk about is this challenge of attribution. We, you know, the Russians still deny it. They say, we didn't do anything. And instead, well, the intelligence community says, well, they did, but we can't tell you how we know that, because sources and methods are classified. It would be nice if we had better attribution. It would be nice if we had some way of looking at provenance of data. This kind of is, is at, at odds with, with Roger's goal of producing better anonymity, it would be nice if we had less anonymity when things are happening in the aggregate, when we're having a lot of these attacks going on, if we could collect them together and be able to have good attribution because our democracy counts on being able to say all of that junk came from over there and that requires a policy response. I mean, ultimately, the computer security people can tell you, yes, we're being attacked by there. And now it becomes a policy response. What should the government do about that attack? And is the provenance strong enough that people are willing to believe it? 
So we have a bunch of very interesting challenges. All right, um, I'm over time, so thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Dan. So um, we've, we've gotten an opportunity to hear from different experts on many different topics, uh, ranging from uh, anonymity to more accountability. Uh, we've talked about some of the interesting things going on at the U.S. Census in the deployment of differential privacy. Uh, we've talked about internet measurement, um, and we've talked about social engineering and how that impacts everything uh, from what we do in our email to, to voting. So at this point, we're going to open it up to have um, Q&A with the panelists. Uh, and for anyone who's online watching the webcast, uh, what I'd recommend is if you send a tweet uh, notifying the, the CCC so that we'll, we'll see your question. Um, but I'd like to begin um, with some basic questions for the panel. Um, and then uh, I can see already a line is building up. Um, but my question to the panel, and just take um, you know, 20, 20 seconds or so for this question, is it, it seems like you've painted sort of a dystopian world to me. Um, you've made me rather concerned. Give me some hope. Um, give me some hope, and what are some of the research gaps that we can fill to? All right, so uh, we'll start with Roger, and then we'll uh, work our way down to Dan before we take questions. Go ahead. In terms of hope, I think one of the most interesting things from the Torah perspective is the growing number of large organizations who are believing in providing privacy or safety or security, whatever word you want to use for it. Uh, for example, the Mozilla people have realized that adding privacy into their browser is the way to distinguish them from the, uh, the terrible privacy destroying chromes of the world. And so being able to, to, to fold these things into large organizations who then have hundreds of millions or billions of people to reach, um, I think that's, I mean, basically step one is figure out how to do it, and step two is to get enough people to care that it reaches the whole world. And I think a lot of these technologies are, uh, they have a possibility to get there. Thanks, Roger. Simpson. So I, I didn't say anything that was dystopian. Um, the Census Bureau is. Uh, <laughs> I work for the government. Is charged to collect data from the American public and to publish high quality statistics such that the contribution of no individual can be found in, in the output. And um, so you can't draw a line from a person's identity to a statistical product. And we're, we're, we've done that for years, and we're going to be doing a better job in the 2020 Census. And we are going to be remaking our entire statistical offering. In, in the meantime, we use the research data centers to allow um, academics to come in and work with the actual confidential data in a secure environment and then remove their results from those research data centers in a way that it, third parties verify that the data that they're bringing out won't harm a person or identify a person but won't identify a person. And um, uh, we, we have a good news story, and we're looking for academics to work with. All right, half full, half empty. All right, <laughs> uh, Philippa. Um, I think one place where I'm optimistic is in terms of uh, research in the area of measuring internet censorship. Uh, when I first came to the problem, the FOCI workshop uh, that happens with Usenix Security was trying to figure out how to get computer scientists and political scientists into the same room. And I think in the past five years, we've come a long way in terms of being able to talk across disciplines, um, getting people in high schools involved, so people who can sort of talk you know, both of the languages of this field. So I think, um, yeah, things are looking a lot better in that respect. All right, Daniela. So I think that knowing that a problem exists is the first step to, to solve the problem. Uh, so we need to, in the case of social engineering and democracy, we need to recognize that the problem exists, that politicians, they are a target, they will be a target, that they will always be a target, and attacks, this type of attacks, they can have great implications for, for democracy. Uh, and regarding, like, there is hope in terms of uh, the, the solutions that researchers are developing to make people aware, to, to warn about deception, cues in email, in websites, in, in, in internet in general, but also other types of things that, for example, politicians can do. One example is perhaps hire a personal assistant, an expert, that handle their work email if possible, if, if it's allowable. Uh, but I, I think there is hope. 
the fact that we know that there is a problem. All right, thank you, Dan. So in the space of voting, the things move at the opposite of internet time. <laughs> things move on more of a <coughs> glacial pace. Nonetheless, um, many states are getting rid of old insecure electronic voting machines and are moving to paper systems, which is a big plus. Uh, the sophisticated design that I described here um, looks like Austin isn't going to be doing it for complicated procurement reasons. And I'm talking to people in other places, maybe San Francisco, maybe Argentina, I'm flying down to Buenos Aires in December. So it's possible that once somebody bites the bullet and builds this, it could then be an open source thing that other people could adopt. Um, on the voter registration side, building a hardened database and replicating it doesn't sound like a huge lift and just a matter of, of the will to build it, and then we can. Okay, great. Well, we have a long line of questions at the mics, so I think, uh, oh, we'll begin over here. Uh, please state your name and affiliation and, and your question. Thank you. Good morning, my name's Jennifer Priest. I'm a professor in the Information School at the University of Maryland. Thank you very much, all of you, for your interesting presentations. Um, my question is particularly targeted to the social engineering and Daniela. Um, I was particularly interested in this. Um, your work is fascinating. Uh, I think as you find out more about how social engineering works using the tools that you've described, you know, such, such as power and these uh, power scarcity and these other things, um, you talked about the hope of one of the hopes is you can make us all aware of these things exist. You talked about politicians, but I'm thinking about the general public, people like myself, and you particularly uh, focused on um, older adults, gay people like me, and their intransigence in changing their opinions. So what I would like to ask you about is, given that you could identify these issues, you can make people aware of these issues, uh, what can you do to persuade people like me to not be so intransigent, but at the same time, not alarm us that you're trying to engineer our opinions? Thank you so much. Uh, I agree with you that for, for people like politicians and, and in, like internet users, it's different. For example, it's very, demand, it's very tiresome for the brain to be in deception mode all the time. So if I'm an internet user and all the time that I'm looking at the, uh, browsing or reading my email, I have to think deception takes away all the fun of it, right? So I think for internet users, what the best thing that our community can do is usable tools that warn in a target fashion, not warn about everything, like with the solutions that we have these days, or train about everything because people forget, people get overloaded, and our, we, we are not hardwired to think deception all the time. We just want to live thinking that people are honest to us. For politicians, unfortunately, because, because what you do is so important and has so many implications to, 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 to the nation, you have to be on deception mode all the time. So I think not only to, to leverage tools that our community will, de will, de will develop, but I think that you have an obligation to be on deception mode all the time, unfortunately. Did I answer your question? I think there are two, I view as two solutions for two, not only politicians, business people too as well. Uh, Pretty much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, name and affiliation, please. Peter Haas, Brown University. Uh, and my question is for Roger. Um, so uh, Kevin's uh, second question about, uh, I believe he was going to ask how many people use Tor, uh, leads to kind of a reputation question about Tor. Um, uh, Tor has a not undeserved reputation that there are a lot of bad things happening. Um, on the internet, and the first place to go if you're going to do something bad on the internet is to Tor to cover your tracks. Um, how does Tor actually deal with that? I do security trainings and people get worried about using Tor because of that. Um, how does Tor deal with that branding issue and open up the tent so that it becomes more of a security tool like Signal that is widely accepted and uh, used en masse? 
Yeah, so there are many different answers to that, and in a few sentences, I can't answer all of them. Uh, but let me tie it into what Dan was saying at the end of there needs to be more accountability on the internet because that way we can track down the bad people. The situation that, so, so the, before I, I get to that, uh, the very short answer is we've spent a lot of energy on the engineering and the research side, and in the meantime, large organizations have put a lot of energy into the PR and, uh, and, and the, the flip side of it. So we, we have been working on building a very strong tool while not working so much on framing it in the press world, and, and that has led to some challenges. Uh, one of the, the things that Dan pointed out, wouldn't it be nice if we could just you know, learn what happens on the internet and, and know who to point to? The situation right now on the internet is the bad guys are doing great. If you're Russia, or if you're some mafia organization, or you're some uh, bad person who wants to break in somewhere, you've got a lot of different options for how to, how to attack people. So, I mean, it would be nice, I agree with Dan, it would be nice to be able to, to point to, you know, this attack came from Russia or something like that. But the reality is the Russians are breaking into my parents' computers and from there they're routing somewhere. So the bad people are doing great on the internet right now. They've got a lot of options. Whereas the good people, the ones who want to follow the laws, who want to, to, to be good citizens on the internet, have very few options. So I think we as a society have a big challenge right now where the bad guys have a lot of options and the good guys have very few options. And I've, we need to solve that not just with building better technology to keep people safe, but also spreading that awareness of how to, how to actually uh, uh, make the world into a safer place that everybody is, is willing to use these security tools. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Gao Wang from Virginia Tech. Uh, it's a very interesting panel all over. Uh, so my question is uh, to uh, uh, Danella uh, uh, about the social engineering attack. Um, so I, the question is related to the first question as well. Uh, so I'm curious about your thoughts about the potential solutions to deal with uh, social engineering. Uh, so more specifically, do you think that you know we can build an automated system to help users to filter out those type of uh, social engineering attempts before a user can be exposed to them? Or there has to be some user level kind of uh, usable tools to do it? Uh, and if so, you know, how do you envision that this could happen? So uh, what my group is doing right now, we are pursuing to detect influence in text, in the case email. So the, the challenge with social engineering is that it might, it might be good or bad. So remember the example of the stamp collection. Could be someone legitimately trying to sell a collection. The person doesn't care about the collection from the 50s and wants to make some money. But on the other hand, could be Eve with a malicious email, with a malicious link that we install malware. So for this case, not for every case, we would like to try to detect deception cues, just like you have a score of deception for this email. Does it have a link? Does it have an attachment? Do you know the sender? And in terms of influence, then that's where natural language processing and machine learning, so I'm partnering with researchers in this area, to try to detect these principles of influencing text. It's very challenging. Are you, can you see that there is an authority uh, influence principle there in this email? If so, the score will probably go up. Is your uh, demographic susceptible to this particular uh, weapon of influence? Oh, then the score should be up. So instead of doing a more one size fits all, so but this needs more research. So we just investigated this particular age group, so we need more research to see, for example, young males, what are the susceptibility, or people from China, or people from Latin America, in Europe. So to try to do this in, in a more personalized fashion, it's very challenging, but that's what research is about, right? That's where, where they want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my name is Omar Chaudhry. I'm an assistant professor at University of Iowa. So my question is to the panel in general. So my question is about uh, the trade-off of security and ethical uh, practices. In a sense, a junior faculty like me, how should they navigate the ethical versus security question? So what I mean by this, you find an attack, what is the right protocol to actually disclose this? And say, do you wait for that to get fixed or do you publish before that? So that's, that's a general question. So I guess 20 years ago, there was no good answer to that question. Today, we have this concept of responsible disclosure. 
I have a student who just found a possible Android vulnerability and we're getting ready to disclose it to Google and Google will have several months to digest it before the paper goes out. And that seems to be an accepted practice these days. The problem only comes in when the vendor isn't cooperating. I had some undergrads a couple years ago who looked at a wireless door lock system that our university had installed in their dorm and they figured out how to spoof it, how to track everybody swiping in and out of their rooms. It was amazing. And the vendor refused to accept that we'd found a problem, even though housing and dining got rid of it. And ultimately we never put it out because I thought it was just too dangerous to have a paper out there explaining how to exploit this vendor's wireless key lock system. Any yeah. other panel? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I guess I can comment on this from uh, the perspective of measuring internet censorship. So this is something that we think about a lot um, when these devices are going to countries where people could get a knock on the door for having strange network traffic coming out of their house. You know, we want to be careful. Uh, one of the things we do is we work with political scientists at the Citizen Lab, and so they have people on the ground all over the world who can report back to us if the situation changes. Um, we have some countries where we just won't test with human users. Um, and in this case, it's sort of a risk-benefit analysis. So, um, in like the sorts of measurements I do can be higher risk if we've got an individual in the country, but the trade-off is that we get to learn about how filtering is going on in that country. So we, we try to balance that, but it's something, at least in um, censorship measurement, that we've been thinking about a lot. Uh, Mark Hill, yes. University of Wisconsin and CCC. So I have a question about provenance and anonymity. So they seem in conflict, but we computer scientists have a long track record of doing the impossible, like public key <laughs> encryption, zero knowledge proofs, blockchains, differential privacy. So are we sure these two are in conflict? Is it proved, are they provably in conflict, or is there a way to have our cake and eat it too? I totally agree with you. There's a, there's a misunderstanding in the world that you have to choose between security and privacy. You have to choose between let's open everything up and have it be insecure, uh, I'm sorry, let's open everything up and therefore it'll be secure versus let's be able to keep things safe and private. And the reality should be that we can build tools that provide both. For example, if I have a privacy system that keeps your personal information safe, then you don't end up having identity theft problems and social engineering problems and so on. So in theory, we should be able to build tools that provide both of them at once. It should not be a choice like that. I'm gonna let Dan answer the other side. So in, in the same sense, sometimes we researchers invent crazy cool things like digital currencies where you spend the money once it's anonymous and you spend the money twice and it's a signed confession. And it might be that we can talk about engineering the internet in such a way that any one packet is, doesn't have any attribution, but after I collect enough of them, maybe I can put something together. It's possible, we can imagine a lot of schemes, it has to be efficient and low cost, otherwise, you know, the internet backbone people would just laugh at you. There's some hard challenges here. I think one of the really big challenges is the fact that the internet is so insecure. We're all running crappy operating systems on crappy hardware and we're routing traffic through routers that are already owned by Chinese intelligence and the NSA and whoever else wanted to do it. So the, the starting point is so bad. Maybe we could come up with some amazing technologies and amazing algorithms and so on in terms of what we could do, deploy on a system that was safe to begin with. But the starting point is so bad that, that we've got a lot of ground to catch up on before we can deploy something like that, even if it should work in theory. Right. Yes. One more? Go for it. All right. Uh, yeah. Beth Mina, Georgia Tech, CCC. Um, thank you. Uh, tremendous presentations and discussions. Thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Um, actually, my question is um, probably more aimed at Philippa. Um, Interested, is there a possibility for connections on folks who are doing censorship work more at the content level? And what I mean by that is uh, Jessica Pater, Georgia Tech, has studied how people posting pro-anorexia content will uh, tag their content differently or structure their content with misleading labels to try to, pro, to get around platform level censorship. Um, Eric Gilbert's kind of done the opposite where uh, posting content with homophones uh, allows you to transmit a message with words that sound like 
the content that you want to convey, but again, doesn't trigger uh, censorship as well. So is there a way of getting kind of at the network level of, of censorship and the content level of censorship, and is there a need to bring those communities together? I think this is a really good question. So a lot of what I do is looking at um, sort of, you know, at the web level, can I access a web page or not? But above that, there's things like Twitter can deactivate accounts, Facebook can remove content. Um, a couple of years ago, we tried looking at this, um, but we didn't get very far. So um, I, I think it's a great area. I think, didn't you have a paper about Twitter censorship? Yeah, so I've done a little bit of work measuring censorship on Weibo in China and Twitter in Turkey. So it turns out that in Chinese, you can find characters that are visually very similar. So people will misspell words. That's what Eric, yeah, looking at and that. And so to a Chinese reader, it makes sense, but to a, to a pattern matching censorship engine, it's garbage. And that's a, that's a clever trick in Chinese. In Turkey, what we saw was that you know, the, the Turkish government was issuing these requests to Twitter. Twitter has an official mechanism called uh, withheld content. And we just started scraping for it. And we found a ridiculous amount, two orders of magnitude more than Twitter discloses in their own transparency report. So that was very exciting. And I think Twitter's response was less than 140 characters. So that was <laughs> not very helpful. <laughs> All right, perhaps a new CCC workshop on this topic. Uh, actually, what Dan was saying reminded me of this project uh, at the Berkman Center at Harvard. It used to be called Chilling Effects, now it's called Lumen. Mm -hmm. um, basically, content providers will post takedown requests they've had. Um, so most of it's like DMCA um, complaints and things like that, but that's sort of another place to look. Yep, thank you. There's a third piece of the censorship world that might be interesting to fold together also, which is the self-censorship side. If you talk to a lot of people in China, they, it's not about whether they can reach the website or whether their post goes away. It's about, yeah, I know they're watching me, so of course I'm not gonna try to say that on the, on the website. So folding all of these together, uh, that's more of a social science side, but, yeah. but very important. Yeah. Yeah, our most recent Twitter study, we compared pre-coup and post-coup data. And sure enough, politically controversial material dropped significantly after the coup. So self-censorship is definitely a thing. On that chilling note, um, I'd, I'd like to give the, the panelists an opportunity to give uh, just a, a few moments of closing remarks. We have about a minute left before the break. Um, but um, your thoughts, uh, any other piece you'd like to suggest to the audience and, and the audience at home on uh, security and privacy for democracy. So um, we'll start with Roger and uh, move forward. So I had another answer to Peter's question originally. One of the challenges that we have uh, in society is explaining the value of privacy tools because when they work, you don't see them. For example, the New York Times runs a uh, whistleblowing site uh, for people to, to reach them with interesting tips and so on. It's called SecureDrop. It's based on Tor. And they get a lot of really interesting stories through their SecureDrop store. People, uh, server. People come to them, they provide interesting things, the New York Times writes a great article about some new thing, and of course they don't mention that it came through SecureDrop because they don't want to give people tips and hints about where their sources are from. So how, this is, this is more of a social science question also, how do we measure the value of the New York Times SecureDrop server when nobody wants to publish the details of how much use it's seeing? So I talked to the New York Times people and also like a lot of other, The Guardian, The Associated Press, there are like 40 mainstream newspapers that run these things and get a lot of really important stories out of them, but nobody wants to talk about the details. How do we, how do we measure how useful they are in a way that we don't hurt anybody? Simpson. Thank you. So, so certainly you, you, you can publish things in aggregate statistics that have been privatized. <laughs> and um, we would, you know, it, that would be another application for differential privacy to see publishing these statistics. So some of the areas where the, the technology needs additional work is how do we publish t uh, statistics that are time series data. And in the move for open data within the, our society, is at odds with the desire for privacy in data. And so we really don't have good strategies for, publish, for taking a data set and stripping identifiers or de-identifying it in a way that 
preserves the usefulness of the data and yet doesn't allow the data subjects to be re-identified. We, we have some techniques that are very expensive and don't produce good data. Uh, if we had more of those techniques, then the census project would be much, much uh, easier to accomplish. And so this is a, a, a good opportunity for academic research. All right, Philippa, final, final thoughts. Um, I guess the last question got me thinking about, um, yeah, the sort of layer eight, you know, the humans that are using the network. Um, and I think in terms of, you know, self-censorship, uh, sites removing content, and a lot of the issues that have come out in the past year about, you know, false content on the internet, I think a lot of this is getting into issues where um, we really need to bring together computer scientists and social scientists because it's going to take some combination of these to solve the problem. Great. Daniela. Uh, so I think my final words, and especially I talk a lot, a lot about phishing and social engineering, but I'm really uh, uh, very interested in this uh, uh, fake news and influencing fake news. Because this goes back to, for example, propaganda and, and even World War II. So this is very old. And my, my suggestion is for us as internet users to try to flip a little bit the, the principles of influence. For example, when you're reading a piece of, or handling a piece of text, or a piece of news or text, piece of email, try to flip the principle of influence. For example, if it's using authorities, trying to convince you based on authority, does this authority is real? Like, does it has credibility? Uh, because it's usually, because there is good and bad, again, the principles of influence, but the problem is that when it's fake, when it's bad. So let's try to, do, it, it's, it's cognitive intense, but I think we, we, it's very important for everybody, uh, and especially for democracy. Dan. So I'm trying to think of a good way to end on a positive note, and I think I want to talk about multidisciplinary work. Some of the most interesting research happens when people collaborate across lines. Our voting work would never have happened without putting cryptographers, statisticians, usability people, and election officials in a room and locking the door for a weekend. Um, and similarly, you can say the same thing about studying censorship, studying uh, phishing attacks, studying is censorship. Uh, I guess I already said that, but maybe I can measure it in a way with statistics that you can't know I said it twice. I think it's important to have these kinds of multidisciplinary things, and when it happens, really good things come out. Um, I'll, I'll wrap by saying that um, Kevin mentioned I served on the Air Force Science Advisory Board. You have these crazy panels where you get, like I'm the only computer scientist looking at some interesting problem that the Air Force cares about, and I bring a computer science perspective to the problem, and I'm talking with somebody else who knows all about uh, how do I do laser comps to satellites? And somebody else who knows all about how do I do hypersonic air transport? And when you put people with these radically diverse backgrounds in a room and lock the door, really exciting things happen, and I think we can do more of that. Okay. Well, we're a little bit over time, but let's thank the, the panel.